I did not cause my mother's death. I love my mother. Present tense, I love my mother. He was definitely our prime suspect. Tonight, one of the biggest mysteries of this fall, and now it's getting even bigger. A boating accident, a wealthy missing mother. His mother is still missing and feared dead. And her grown son lost at sea, then found seven days later. Nathan Carmen now back on land. A real life castaway, but with one big difference. Is it missing at sea or murder at sea? Can you understand what people see? You were the last person to see people alive. Tonight, a 2020 investigation. Hello, Nathan, are you there? With the only reporter to sit down with Nathan. Do you think the police have picked on you? I think that the police saw me as the lowest hanging fruit. But a lot of people would say his speech pattern is different because he's different. He has Asperger's. Targeted because of his diagnosis or because something suspicious is going on? What's the talk in your industry? What do people think? He might have not been out there for seven days. Now with an unsolved murder in the family's past. There is a killer out there. And a new strike against Nathan just this week. And it's not good news for Nathan. They want to explore whether or not you sank the boat on purpose. We're done here. We're not this trying to make you uncomfortable. We're done here this evening. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Mueller. As we come on the air tonight, breaking news. Just this week, this is a story right out of the movies. Being rescued at sea after floating on a raft for a week. But tonight here, a major new twist in this ongoing case. That's right. An insurance company is now claiming the boat sank due to intentional acts. What will you think after you watch? Let us know on Facebook and Twitter. Our Lindsay Janice was the only reporter to interview the mysterious man at the center of it all. And how she got that exclusive is a story all its own. My name is Devin. I work the overnight shift at ABC News. On the night of September 26th, I saw that one of the affiliate reporters had tweeted about someone who had been rescued at sea. I sent it around, but you know, of course, we didn't have too many of the details besides that he'd been found. He was found in a life raft with a life jacket on. He was reported to be in good condition. They sent Lindsay Janice. He's Lindsay Janice. Lindsay Janice has that story for us. The freighter he is on is due to arrive in Boston. When I first heard about the Nathan Carmen story, it looked like an inspiring story of survival. The son rescued off Martha's Vineyard. Nathan had gone out on this fishing boat with his 54-year-old mother, Linda, and never returned. The Coast Guard combed hundreds of miles of ocean in vain, and they'd just given up hope when the call came in. A young man found alone, floating on a life raft. Found alive in good condition. The stunning discovery made in the open ocean by this Chinese freighter carrying scrap metal about 100 miles south of Ram Point Marina in Rhode Island, where he'd set sail. They'll get the chance to speak with Nathan Carmen Tuesday night. Nathan, this is United States Coast Guard Boston. I need to understand what happened. Yeah, we all do. But so far, the only explanation? This short radio call from the Coast Guard to Nathan aboard that freighter. Mom and I, two people, myself and my mom, were fishing at Block Canyon, and there was a funny noise in the engine compartment. When I saw the life raft, I did not see my mom. Uh, have you found her? Uh, no, we, uh, we haven't been able to find her yet. The next day, Nathan arrives in Boston, the questions waiting for him at the dock. The most important question is, how did you survive and not your mother? When we first see him, he shows little emotion. His six foot three inch frame awkwardly apparelled in the white crew suit he was given after his rescue. That night, Nathan returns to his home in rural Vermont and makes his first public statement. I would just like to thank the public uh, for their prayers and for their concern for both my mother and for myself. Emotionally, I've been through a huge amount and I, my request is just to be allowed to mourn naturally. It seems that's all he has to say. But then Nathan decides to grant us an exclusive interview. He instructs us to meet him on this bench. 
He seems anxious, traumatized. I'm not sure how best to say this. Worried he won't look or sound good on camera. Oh, Lord, may you help us to... He even uh, prays about it. To may help me to accurately uh, and effectively express uh, what I've been through. There's a reason Nathan doesn't speak in the tongues of angels. He's been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which is on the autism spectrum, associated with social awkwardness and flat measured speech patterns. Let's begin, if we could, with the fishing trip. Our conversation will last into the night, but it ends up a fragmented account with plenty of blank spaces. I'm not going to go into that now. I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to go there. But Nathan is able to provide more details about that ordeal at sea. Uh, my mom and I fished very frequently together. That's the primary thing that we did to spend time with one another. We fished probably every other week. Despite his humble appearance, it turns out Nathan is actually from a wealthy New England family, the first of many surprises. His mom, Linda, a nurse who worked with autism patients, didn't even like to eat fish, but she loved catching them with Nathan. In this Facebook posting, she said there was no better way to connect. Nathan had purchased this 31-foot fishing boat named the Chicken Pox after seeing it advertised online. He says that on September 17th, he and his mom set out for that fateful trip just before midnight. These fishing trips, you would often leave, uh, what, at night or in the early hours of the morning? Uh, that's correct. We met at the marina in Rhode Island, got all of our gear on board, pushed off from the dock. Nathan wanted that night to be different. He says that instead of the usual trip of about 20 miles to Block Island for striped bass, he decided to go deep sea tuna fishing to that area called Block Canyon. That's much farther offshore. That's offshore fishing. It takes all night to get there. The seabed here drops from a few hundred feet below the surface to a thousand feet or deeper, a perfect spot for those giant tuna they were after. I have experienced boating. I have uh, experienced fishing. I did not have experience offshore fishing. But Nathan was comfortable making the trip because he says the seas were calm. After a smooth cruise through the night, we arrived just as the sun was rising. Nathan says the new day was perfect. They set their lines and fish for tuna all by themselves. They have life vests on board, but weren't wearing them. Hours passed. It was midday when he says the trouble started. So what happened? What went wrong? I heard a noise. A funny noise coming from the engine. The engine sounded different. I looked in the hatch where the engine was. I observed there was water, quite a bit of water. And the belt on the engine uh, was picking up water and kind of spinning it. What did you think? I knew that there was a serious problem, but I didn't think we were sinking. I thought that I was going to diagnose the problem uh, and that we were going to go back to shore. He says he closed the hatch and shut off the engine. He says he told his mother to gather the fishing lines in the rear, while he says he brought the ditch bags full of safety gear up to the front. But he says to his shock, in no time, the boat was underwater. I was walking on the deck, it was there, and then it wasn't. Any sign of your mother at this point? No, not at that point. He claims he was totally disoriented, doesn't remember hearing his mother or seeing her. The life raft was designed to inflate automatically. Nathan says he swam to it. I got on board the life raft and was looking around, and I was calling out uh, to my mom. I did not see or hear my mom. And I was blowing the whistle with three loud, uh, short bursts, which is a distress signal. So if she had been on, on, on the surface of the water, you feel like you would have been able to see her? I assume that if she had been on the surface and conscious that she would have been calling out to me and I would have been able to find her. But I didn't know why that hadn't happened. Now, by his account, he was all alone in a kind of floating tent, a tiny speck of orange in a vast gray sea. As night fell, he was drifting in the darkness. Like Tom Hanks in Castaway, Nathan says he spent days alone out in the open water until, just like the movie,
The freighter that saved Nathan, aptly named the Orient Lucky, was docked when we intercepted it later that week. They'd recorded this remarkable footage of the rescue. Look here. That little figure is Nathan, clinging to a life preserver, clinging to life, then jumping into the churning seas as the ship struggles to stay close enough to grab him. We could see he was very tired, exhausted. He rested for a while, clinging onto the ladder. Our crew helped him to get on board the ship. I was no longer lost, and that's when I allowed myself to feel relief. What was going through your mind? I'm safe. It's a compelling, heartstring tugging story of loss and survival. That I love my mother. Present tense, I love my mother. But is it also something more? Police want to know what role, if any, Nathan Carmen played in his mother's disappearance. Wait a second. Was this just an accident? Is his story really the whole story? As more details emerge, the portrait of the young fisherman takes on a darker hue. It paints a very troubling picture as to what was Nathan's intent. continues with more of Lost at Sea. Nathan Carmen was found floating on a life raft in the ocean. His Two members of the Carmen family went out to sea. Only one came back. So why are people so suspicious about what exactly happened to Nathan's mother, Linda? Now officials are investigating just how the 31-foot boat sank. That suspicion deepens as we learn that the mother-son relationship could be as choppy as the North Atlantic. Well, I think anyone who has a child that has uh, autism or Asperger's, it's difficult. There were conflicts on occasion, but he considered her his best friend. In addition to any personal friction, investigators see a possible financial incentive for foul play. Is Nathan due to get a huge windfall? Is he due to get all of his mother's money? That's my understanding. Millions of dollars? Yes. I think it's around seven, eight million. That's why a phalanx of investigators, local police, the Coast Guard, even the FBI, are taking a hard look at signs of possible criminal activity on that doomed boat. And so are we. This is Ram Point Marina in Rhode Island, where Nathan and Linda set sail that night in September. Hi, Lindsay. Welcome aboard. Come on in. Captain Dave McCormick runs Irish Jig Charters and was out fishing the day Nathan and his mother set out on that seven-hour trip to Block Canyon. Captain Dave considers it highly unusual for a mother and son to fish alone for tuna. Those fish can weigh hundreds of pounds. There's usually a crew of four, and it's usually all experienced guys. Usually a crew of four experienced fishermen. Usually, you know, to be smart about things. On top of that, Captain Dave says a 31-foot boat like the chicken pox would be too small a vessel for even the most experienced fishermen. And remember, Nathan had never done this before. First time you've taken your boat that far offshore. That's correct. Captain Dave is also puzzled by Nathan's actions after he says he reached Block Canyon and realized the boat was taking on water. There was a functioning alert system on board, but Nathan never used it. Far east, 1069. How long does it take to activate it or make a mate? Oh, it's call? just a matter of seconds. Just flip the switch and it's activated. It's a manual type. The Coast Guard said there was no mayday call. Did you have a radio on the boat? They had a radio and there was also an emergency position indicating radio beacon. I didn't know that we were sinking. I knew that we had a problem, but I didn't know that we were sinking until we sank. If you look at Nathan's behavior, you take all of those things collectively together, and it paints a very troubling picture as to what was Nathan's intent and what actually did happen to his mother. Hello, this is Nathan Carmen. And what to make of Nathan's seemingly odd behavior after he was rescued. Just listen to his call with the Coast Guard. So I got to the life raft after I got my bearings, and I was whistling and calling and looking around, and I didn't see her. Nathan's affect is as flat as pavement as he recounts the tragic loss of his mother, asking about her seemingly as an afterthought. Uh, when I saw the life raft, I did not see my mom. Uh, have you found her? 
But wait before you judge. Psychologist Dr. Rebecca Sachs says people with Asperger's often speak without emotion and order their thoughts in a way others might find unusual. Picking out what is the most important piece of information is often really, really difficult. So they'll sort of give information in a linear fashion. So you're saying that it's not necessarily unusual that he didn't lead with, my mother is missing. Correct. Sachs has never treated Nathan, but she says people with Asperger's have trouble interacting with others, which can lead to misunderstanding. Take what happened at this Donald Trump rally in New Hampshire, which Nathan attended just weeks before his mother's disappearance. Nathan, who told us he's a big Trump supporter, was removed from the rally after the man who took this photo reported him to security because he said he was uncomfortable with Nathan's demeanor. And now watch this odd moment during our interview when Nathan reveals his mother needed coaxing to go on that fishing trip at all. She was concerned about safety. That's correct. It was not an argument. Uh, I was kind of pestering my mom. She w had always been kind of skittish. Uh, I'm stopping right here with that question. Oh, okay. Like, uh, out of nowhere. Yeah, we're stopping right there. Okay. And it's like, what happened? I sometimes talk about this need to control things or thinking they know how to guide a situation or guide a conversation. I think that's just an impression that comes off. So maybe some of that seemingly defensive or suspicious behavior can be explained by Nathan's Asperger's. During our interview, it's hard to get a full picture of him, in part because he's on edge after a crowd of media gathered, hoping to get to speak with him. As he got back in his truck, I head back to New York, haunted by one question. Just who is Nathan Carmen anyway? It's time to dig deeper for an answer. Time to explore some dark and troubling secrets of Nathan's past. This wasn't the first time he was in the news. New Haven's patrol officers have all been briefed to keep a lookout for Nathan Carmen. When 2020 continues. Back in the newsroom, the world keeps turning. A deadly train accident in New Jersey. Images of chaos and panic. Hurricane Matthew batters the southeast. But I can't forget about the lonely young man up in New England. Our interview made headlines, but so much was left unsaid about Nathan's past, about how he survived. And as the days go by, the swells of suspicion are bearing down on him like a nor'easter. You've got to presume that he's thinking, I'm going to tell my story, I'm going to put it out there, it's going to end this. That's not what happened. And then, surprise. 193 miles. Nathan invites us back to Vermont for a second interview. We're hoping this time he'll fill in some blanks. When we arrive at his home. Hi, Nathan, how are you? Nathan seems as adrift as he was out in the ocean. I was lost at sea. My mom died. But it would be great to have people embracing you, saying we're glad you're home, we're glad you're alive, and also helping me to deal with my mom's death. It hasn't been that. Nathan says he was counting on support from Linda's three sisters, his aunts. Instead, there's been a stony silence. I haven't received any calls. Not from a single one of them. That's correct. It makes me feel like I have no family. I, don't, I want to have family. I want them to be my family. Right. Nathan's aunts don't want to speak with us either. It's a terribly, terribly upsetting and difficult time. Their focus is not on relationships. It's on getting answers to questions. This barn may be from well before 1850. I don't wow. know. Despite whispers he might have killed his mother for millions of dollars, Nathan's hardly living the lush life up here. He spends his days renovating this house, hoping to flip it by the springtime. So far, the only interested parties to come knocking have been the police, searching for evidence of a crime on the high seas. The 22-year-old's demeanor was strange. People are asking, who is this 22-year-old man? Driving around with Nathan, he seems unfazed by the police attention. Had your mom come up to visit you here? Yes, we, she drove up uh, to the area frequently, and we saw each other. He says he called us back to set the record straight, because so much of what he's seen on the news has been unfair. 
Right this way. This is not easy for Nathan. I'm not someone who understands relationships or who's good about talking about emotions. But he's willing to try. As he opens up a bit, it's clear he's had a hard life. The loneliness he's feeling now is nothing new. In fact, it's been a lifelong companion. Nathan grew up about 100 miles south of here in Middletown, Connecticut, a suburb of Hartford, an only child from a broken home. His parents divorced when he was very young, and for most of that time, his mother, Linda, was everything to him. What was she like? She was a good person, a warm person. We did have a challenging relationship at one point in my life, but she was the only family who I really had, and now I don't have her, and that's a tremendous loss. You feel alone? Yes. When I had her, I, I, I didn't feel alone. Considering she was the most important person in his life, the most important and fundamental question is, would he have really wanted to kill her? Another port in the storm, this man, his grandfather, Linda's dad, John Shockless, a multimillionaire real estate and nursing home developer. He was like a father to me, and I know I was like a son to him. They ate dinner together regularly at Grandpa's house, and there were even numerous take-your-grandson-to-work experiences when Shockless carted young Nathan to business meetings with his associate, Pat Goggins. I got the feeling that John um, had a very good relationship with him and was trying to cultivate that. Nathan was as uh, introverted as John was extroverted. Not surprisingly, that introverted personality trait did not go over big at Middletown High School, where classmates recall him being mocked. But he did have one close friend, a beautiful white horse named Cruz. Lucky you, having your own horse. Yes, I was very fortunate in that regard, and I was able to really form a strong bond emotionally. But when Nathan was 17, Cruz died, and Nathan's fragile world fell apart. Shortly after Cruz died, you ran away from home. Police are asking you for your help. They're trying to find a missing teenager from Middletown. Patrol officers have all been briefed to keep a lookout for Nathan Carmen. Nathan had been spotted taking a bus. Teams of searchers looked for him for days. Running away from home was something that I felt that I had to do at the time. I don't fully understand or comprehend uh, that sitting here now. He was eventually found nearly 600 miles away in rural Virginia. When he returned home, Nathan was reportedly hospitalized briefly for mental health issues. When you returned home after you'd run away, when you were found? Yeah, that gets into my personal health records, which I'm not going to disclose Did or discuss. Did things get better or did they get worse? I, I, I can't answer that question and we're done with uh, before I turned 18. Nathan was released, and for a time, whatever storm was raging inside of him subsided. But for how long? He was found shot and killed here. In Coming the up, over the, the holidays turn bloody, as Grandpa Shockless is gunned down just before Christmas. And the police want to know, did his quiet, beloved grandson pull the trigger? Yes, Nathan was a suspect in the murder of his grandfather. Stay with us. Twenty continues with Lost at Sea. Christmas in New England, and people come from miles around to see this elaborate light display John Shockless puts up at one of his many properties. But the holiday spirit ends abruptly on the violent night of December 20th, 2013, when the real estate millionaire is found shot to death in his Connecticut home. Authorities say execution style. One of his daughters had gone to check on him and found him in his bed with what looked to be gunshot wounds to his head and back. Police are now calling the shooting death of an 87-year-old man a homicide. Who would want John Chakalos dead? It's a very good question. At first, police wonder, could it have been his daughter, Linda? There were reports of a big fight over the family fortune that got violent, Linda punching and kicking her father. In the investigation, it has to be a relevant question to ask, is that incident connected to what happened to him? But a lie detector test clears Linda. So logically, cops focus on the last person known to see Shockless alive, none other than his beloved grandson. Nathan had no obvious motive to gun down his granddad, 
but he had opportunity. The two had dinner together earlier that evening, but police say Nathan's whereabouts later that night are unaccounted for. The authorities wonder, could that have been the time when he committed a murder? And according to this search warrant, there is a litany of other circumstantial evidence. It says Nathan discarded both the hard drive of his computer and the GPS unit used on the morning of December 20th, 2013. That he'd recently bought a 308 caliber rifle, the same caliber weapon used in the homicide of John Shockless. Coincidentally, neither Nathan's rifle nor the murder weapon were ever found. Is it fair to say he was your prime suspect? Yes, that is fair to say. He was definitely our prime suspect. Police say that after John Shockless' murder, Linda's sisters were afraid enough to hire armed security to protect them in their homes. Were they afraid of Nathan? John Shackles was murdered in cold blood in his bed in his home. Uh, it would be irrational not to feel some fear as a result of that. With regard to the murder of Nathan's grandfather, isn't the circumstantial evidence there strong? Well, if it, if it, if it were there, and it were strong, they would have arrested him. That search warrant has a list a mile long of things that make Nathan look suspicious. You can't arrest anybody in America on mere suspicion. You have to have probable cause. Is there any truth to any of those allegations? No, uh, there's not any truth uh, to any allegation. Nathan adamantly insists he's innocent. He says when the police came to interview him, he never tried to hide anything. If they had asked me, Nathan, can we look at your hard drive? Or Nathan, can we have your GPS? At that time, when, I had, when they were in my apartment, my answer would have been, sure, gladly, you can take it. Uh, but they didn't. Do you think the police have picked on you? I think that the police saw me as the lowest hanging fruit after my grandfather died because they saw that I had uh, been diagnosed with Asperger's. There's an element here of prejudice against Nathan because of his disability. Because when the police talk to him, they immediately become suspicious because of his odd manner. In fact, experts tell us people on the autism spectrum are more likely to be victims of crime than perpetrators. My understanding is that if you lie to the police and they can prove you lied to them, uh, they can arrest you for that. They haven't done so. Nathan remains a suspect in the murder of his grandfather. The investigation is actually very active at the moment and ongoing. Just last month, law enforcement went back to the scene of the crime. Hoping this helps them find more answers. The FBI also conducted a separate search elsewhere. The FBI and other agencies searching property owned by John Chakalos. Over a dozen agents wearing hazmat suits scoured this abandoned New Hampshire property owned by the family, continuing the quest for the missing murder weapon. But it's not just the investigation into his grandfather's murder hanging over Nathan's head. The inquiry into his mother's disappearance at sea is also steaming ahead. Suspicious new details have emerged. Allegations of sabotage. Whatever he was doing was wrong. Allegations Nathan would rather not discuss. I'm just asking you to defend yourself against these people who are saying that you did something to your boat that would make it sink. We're done for this evening period. We're done We're here. not this trying to make you uncomfortable. We're Why is Nathan so agitated? We're done here. Is it his condition? The suspicions about him? Or a guilty conscience? No matter what Nathan Carmen says, the fog of suspicion isn't lifting. Can you understand what people see? You were the last person to see two people alive. You were either incredibly unlucky, the most unlucky guy, or you had something to do with those two deaths. What do you say to that? I say that there is no relationship between my having uh, been the last person other than the killer to have seen my grandfather alive and my having been on the boat with my mother when it sank. I did not kill my grandfather. I did not cause my mother's death. Uh, and, and I want people to know that. Nathan may sound sincere, but is he credible? The story makes no sense. Supposedly the boat springs a leak and no one can say, hey mom, you want to join me on the raft? There are too many questions without answers and too many answers without justice. When we ask Nathan what happened to cause the boat to sink, he says he simply doesn't know. 
I'm not a diesel engine mechanic. Uh, that's the most basic way that I can respond to it. But the police aren't buying that. They executed a search warrant of Nathan's home, looking for evidence of reckless endangerment, noting that Nathan had been seen doing repairs on the boat that potentially rendered it unsafe. Boat owner Mike Iozzi bumped into Nathan on the dock just hours before his fishing trip and told police that he saw Nathan doing something highly suspicious. It kind of caught my eye when I saw him leaning over the back and drilling two holes in the transom of the boat. Drilling holes? Mike was dumbfounded. He says Nathan told him that he was removing stabilization devices like these, something called trim tabs. Mike says that made no sense. You don't have to drill a hole to take the trim tabs off. Why would you drill a hole in the, in the boat? Whatever he was doing was wrong. I'm not sure how I can respond other than saying <laughs> he says one thing, I say this is what actually happened. Right. But. Okay. Nathan categorically denies any suggestion that he sabotaged the boat. He admits removing the trim tabs but claims he patched the holes properly with marine putty. When we press him, he reaches a breaking point. All I can say is what happened. I can't say, I, if other people want to. I'm just asking to you to defend yourself against these people who are saying that you did something to your boat that would make it sink. That's not true. OK. Another thing that's happened since we last got together, police searched your mom's home. Yeah, we're, we're, Did you know anything about that? We're done for this evening period. We're done. We're not trying to make you uncomfortable. We're, we're, we're trying to give you an opportunity to answer some of these allegations. We're done here this evening. When someone gets up from an interview, calls it off, typically think, oh, the person can't deal with the heat. The questions are too tough. But maybe there's another explanation here. And that is his medical condition. A person with autism may not understand exactly all the social rules of what may happen, how maybe their instinct to uh, react may not always be the most appropriate. Sure enough, about 20 minutes later, Nathan is ready to sit back down as we probe one final, highly curious part of his story. Namely, what exactly happened during those seven days on that life raft? Most so people would I, panic, Nathan. Most people would think, I'm going to die out here. Uh, and, and the way that I handled that was to focus on uh, what I had to do in order to survive. Nathan says he had fresh water packets in his survival bags, as well as kits to allow him to drink seawater. He also had food bars. He says he allowed himself only one each day. Here we go, Wilson. You don't have to worry about anything. In Castaway, Tom Hanks talks to a volleyball he names Wilson. Wilson! I'm coming! Wilson! Nathan says he talked with God. I had prayed in the morning and I prayed in the evening. That made you feel less alone? That was very comforting. Of course, those prayers were answered when the Orient Lucky appeared. And after a week at sea, the miracle was complete. Or was it? So if you were 100 miles offshore, you'd want, I'd want a bigger life raft, a better life better raft? Better life raft, yeah. Jim O'Connor sells life rafts for a living, and he says Nathan's account just doesn't hold water. Nathan says he was in that life raft for about a week. Does that sound survivable to you? Barely. It happens. It has happened. But that life raft was not the type of life raft that somebody would normally survive a week in, in the conditions that he was in. Nathan says the seas were calm sometimes and then very rough with waves as high as 13 feet. He says he would close the door and ride it out. I expected the life raft to flip over at some point just because you're in a small life raft in big seas. But O'Connor says the type of raft Nathan was in would have tumbled so violently he would likely have broken bones. He was in really good shape. For somebody that was in 13-foot seas in a small life raft, he was in remarkably good shape. What's the talk in your industry? What do people think? That he might have not been out there for seven days, that he might have been in the life raft for a day or two. If the boat didn't sink on day one and sunk 
on day four or day seven, that fundamentally changes the story. Could Nathan have drilled and filled those holes, sailed into the open water, killed his mother, and then waited to scuttle the chicken pox until he saw the Orient Lucky coming over the horizon? He could have thrown her overboard, stayed on the boat for a while. We don't know exactly when that boat sunk. It's easy to speculate about foul play, but proving it won't be smooth sailing. The wreck of the chicken pox may be a thousand feet underwater, and without the evidence, it's hard to see anything more than a circumstantial case against Nathan. Well, I say produce the evidence. If you don't have the evidence, please keep your mouth shut because you're ruining someone's life. But wait. New information tonight in the case of a mother-son fishing trip. In Just September this week, one group of investigators says they have come to a conclusion. Nathan puts his mother to rest, but not the nagging questions. Have police told you anything about the status of the investigation in Rhode Island? Now I'm going to drive off. Stay with us. private service held today to remember Linda Carmen. Six weeks after she was lost at sea, Linda Carmen's body still hasn't been recovered. Yet her son Nathan organizes a memorial for her in downtown Hartford, Connecticut. Nathan carries flowers himself to the sparsely attended service. The media outnumber the mourners. How have you been these last several weeks? It's been very difficult. How is the service today, Nathan? Uh, the whole family was invited. Uh, I'm glad uh, that many of my fr mom's friends chose to attend. But conspicuously absent from the service, Nathan's three aunts. Why didn't Linda's sisters attend the memorial service that Nathan organized? They didn't feel it appropriate to have a memorial service when we don't know what happened. Are Linda's sisters afraid of Nathan right now? L Linda's sisters are afraid. Uh, as we all should be. There is a killer out there. I wish very much that my whole family could have come together uh, to pray for my mom. I wish desperately that my mom was rescued. Uh, I hope that she will be found. Tell and me, now tell I, us about your relationship service. with her. Now I'm going to drive off. And what about your grandfather? I need we'll to close to my door. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Nathan. Take care of yourself. In the midst of all this family dysfunction and the ongoing criminal investigation, the questions hang in the wintry New England air. If Nathan did plan to kill his mother, why would he have risked his life in that raft, since he had no way of knowing he'd be rescued? Or was the multi-million dollar fortune he's now set to inherit from his mother motive enough to risk it? Until these cases are solved and proven that he didn't have some involvement, people are going to believe he is the only game in town. He's the right guy. But just this week, shocking headlines. An insurance investigation blames Nathan directly. The insurance company filed papers in U.S. District Court claiming Nathan made incomplete, improper, and faulty repairs to the boat. The company won't pay his claim.